You're listening to Connect Communities Podcast, recorded live in Stamford, Connecticut. If you'd like to know more about our community, stop by our website at www.connectcommunity.tv. Enjoy the message. For those of you watching online, we're so glad that you're with us. Uh, I encourage you to come in person next week. We're going to be in person every week now. I'm so excited. Isn't that great? That's great. I'm excited about that. It's going to be awesome. All right. Facing Your Demons. That's the name of the series. Um, and if you have the app, I know that once we went on lockdown, the, the, the fill in the blanks kind of went away, but we're bringing it back. So if you'd like to follow the message notes on the app and go into the fill in the blank section, you just have to go to live and then message notes. It's all in there. The scriptures are in there. You can add your own notes there and you can follow along. Uh, for those of you watching online as well, if you want to pull out your phone, open the Connect Community app and follow along. Uh, that will help you just to uh, um, follow the message and, and have the scriptures there for you if you want to use it for reference later. All right. Message title, if you're taking notes, is it was not by chance. It was not by chance. Now, we're starting this new series today. So let me give you a preview of the series because it's designed to help you identify and deal with some of those things that uh, we often don't understand. We go through things uh, in life. We face some of those things even in us. Uh, and uh, we, it, usually we, when we come into a part of us that we don't really like, we, we try not to deal with it. We try to kind of brush it away or not, not get into one of those circumstances again where that part of us surfaces, right? And maybe it might be for you. It might be that it's your temper or maybe it's a bad memory that you have uh, from the past, or it might be a repeating circumstance that comes at you all the time, and it's out of your control, but it comes at you, and, and you face it. And, and, or maybe it's a propensity that you have to do wrong in a certain area. You don't want to do that wrong. You don't want to go back to that bad habit, but it just it keeps happening, and you feel like you can't help it. When we face situations like that, when we come face to face with those parts of us, we call it facing our demons, which really means that we have to confront a bad part of us. We have to confront that part of us that we are not too uh, um, fond of. So what can happen over time, though, is that the more we get into those circumstances, the more we face those things, uh, we, it can, it can get, those things can get cemented. And hardened in the foundation of our identity. It can become part of who we are. And before long, we begin to think that those things are immutable parts of us. That those things are in us and they are part of us and we can't change it. So that bad memory that you have from something that happened to you long ago, it's become a part of who you are. So you just embrace the consequences of it, and because of it, you're a fearful person. So you just embrace the fearfulness, and you try to live life that way, coping with it. The repeating circumstance that comes against you from time to time, that's beyond your control, and, and it's no longer something out there. It becomes part of you. It defines you, and, and now you navigate, you navigate life thinking that you're cursed. There might be something about you that just is not quite right, and you just try to function. Maybe that anger that's so easily triggered now has accumulated over the years, has become a part of you. And so you just identify as an angry guy. You just identify as an angry girl. And even though it wasn't always like that, now you think, it's who I am. It's, to, it's whom I have become. What are those things actually? Why do we keep dealing with them and, 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 and are, have difficulty resolving them? See, sometimes instead of trying to sort through these problems, we try to cope with it by finding positive descriptions to help us live with our shortcomings. <clears throat> we do that sometimes, don't we? Listen, I don't have trust issues. I don't have trust issues because of my past. I am careful and I keep my distance. Listen, I'm not prone to pick a fight. I'm confrontational. I, I, I just tell it like it is. Listen, I, I don't use food as a coping mechanism for my sadness, anxiety, and depression. I'm a foodie. I just love food. 
We try to cover our negatives with some positives, don't we? I'm not, I don't have a bad taste in, in sports. I, I'm a Cowboys fan. <laughs> this is not to condemn anybody except Cowboys fans. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. It's a joke. The truth, is that, the truth is that we're all on a journey. We all deal with these things. We all face these things. We all have things that we carry. We all have issues. We all have, from time to time, face our demons. And so the next four weeks, we're going to take time to equip you with spiritual understanding so that you can discern the origin of some of these things and address them the right way. Look at this scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14 says this. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him. And he's not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. Certain things can only be understood in the spirit because they are spiritual. Those things are spiritual, so they can only be understood in the spirit. And some of us, we've been trying to fight and address spiritual things in the natural, in the natural way. So we try to fight it with discipline, exercise, reading more, sleeping at the right time, and doing all these things that are good for you. But you can't get to the, beneath the surface, to the root of the problem. This is true of those who are new to faith, who didn't grow up in faith or a spiritual life. Maybe you grew up believing that everything is natural, physical, and material. So you can't really understand why your strategy is not working. But it can also be true for those who grew up in church, people who grew up in the faith, people who grew up with a spiritual reality. You might even have language to describe some of these things. You might even have language to be able to communicate what these things are. But, but the spiritual reality, because you grew up in it, you got so accustomed to it, it's almost like a folklore to you. It's almost like a cultural thing. It's not really an actual reality that you can interact and exist in. So we're going we're gonna to unpack some of these things. We're going to explore some of these things in the coming weeks. Because you are a spiritual being. And as a spiritual being, you deal with spiritual things. So here are the three things that we're going to deal with in the next three weeks. Okay? Not counting today. Today we're going to start with this uh, idea of identity. But in the next three weeks, we're going to talk about the reality of negative mindsets. Some of you, you might be stuck in negative mindsets. Things that you don't even realize you think Things you don't even realize you identify with, but they become part of your identity. The, the, the reality of curses is the second thing we're going to deal with. You could be up against a curse. Curses are real, everybody. It could be that, that you might be dealing with a spiritual curse that has been in your family for generations. And then there's the reality of evil spirits. And this is a reality people believe in more easily. Even atheists believe in evil spirits because they believe in evil. But the problem is that even though we believe in evil, we, we, we believe that evil is something out there that doesn't, doesn't enter our realm of our lives. As long as we try to be a good person, evil is going to be out there. And, and so uh, we're going to explore the idea of evil spirits and, and, and look into the reality of the scriptures and your position, your authority, and what God has for you as we interact in the world and, and, and get exposed to all of these things. All right? I believe this is going to be an awesome four weeks. And this is what I'm believing for, that you will experience freedom, deliverance, that you're going to have joy, that you're going to, you're going to find a new spiritual strength, and that as you begin to face those things, you're going to be able not only to resolve them, but win and find freedom and overcome them and become the person that God has called you to be. So I'm excited. I hope you come back. I hope that you, that you stay connected, that you're, you're allowing the scriptures that we're going to read through uh, these weeks to, to uh, uh, you, you meditate on them and you allow them to shape you because I believe uh, it's going to be great. And the best part is that we're going to be in person. So it's going to be great. So today, today I want to address that first part. That's why the message is called, um, It Was Not By Chance. The first part of, of, of the, that you might have embraced, right? Maybe you embrace some of those shortcomings, some of those negative things, and, and you, you've, bec you've come to believe that that's part of who you are. Perhaps you've embraced negative labels, and nobody knows about it. You haven't vocalized that you've embraced these labels. But every time there's a conversation, 
Every time you engage with a situation that that part of you you don't like is either mentioned or is exemplified, there's a little voice, a little whisper on the back of your head that says, that's who you are. And you agree with it. You say, that's who I am. You wouldn't say it out loud, but it's there. It's in your mind. It's in your spirit. It's in your soul. I'm irresponsible. I'm not good enough. I'm weak. I can't overcome this. I can't let people get too close because if they get too close, they're going to see who I am. And if they see who I am, they're not going to like it. I'm not likable. And we can embrace those things. What is your I can't blank? What is your I'm not blank? What are some of those things, some of those labels that have stuck with you that you haven't tell, told anybody. See, I'm not talking about natural limitations. There was a time when I was a kid that I believed I could fly. I didn't believe I could fly. I wish I could fly. I wanted to fly. Maybe I was the only one. I might have prayed for it a couple times, really believing that maybe I could just levitate a little bit. But you know who I blame? I have people that I blame for it. I blame Dean Cain and Terry Hatcher. Because the new adventures of Superman was my jam. I love that show. Some of you are way too young to remember that show. But it's out there. And uh, I recommend. It's a great show. He puts on glasses. Nobody knows who he is. He takes off his glasses. And he can fly. It's amazing. Now, I'm never going to fly. At least not in this life. You're never going to fly. I'm sorry to break it to you. Okay? That's what I had for today, by the way. You, I'm kidding. <laughs> Some of you are never going to sing. You're never going to sing on a microphone, on a stage, unless the microphone is a loofah and the stage is in your bathroom, in the shower. Then you're going to sing. I'm not talking about those limitations, those natural limitations. I'm talking about the limitations that are caused by a warped sense of self. Because things have happened to you that cause you to have a distorted view of who you are. You have a limited view of who you are. You don't even consider the possibility that God can take you from where you are to that place that you dream of. You don't even consider the possibility that Jesus wants you to live a better life. That he doesn't want you to be stuck where you are. That he wants you to go further. You don't even call the number. You don't even, you don't even try for the interview. You don't even get in the room to have the, have the conversation. Because in your mind, it's just not going to happen. There is no way. I'm not even going to get my hopes up. Those are the limitations that I'm talking about. I don't know if you've ever been in front of a wacky mirror. Have you ever seen those wacky mirrors that distort your body and you're in front of it and like you look all... Some of you, that's, that's, that's the way you see yourself. You have a wacky, uh, uh, distorted version of who you actually are. And the worst part is this. You think it just happened by chance. You think that those things that you face... The way that, that, you, that, that, that you see yourself just happened by chance. You think it's that your life, the things you went through, was a random assortment of things. And then, and then what you face is a random assortment of things. And you can't do anything about it. It's just what it is. But what if I told you that it was not by chance? What if I told you that there, there have been forces working against you to get your self-image out of shape? What if I told you that there are things that were stumbling block locks, there were traps that were strategically placed on your path to destroy God's image in your life? To destroy the God image that He purposed for you. The life that He purposed for you. Let me show you. Let's go to Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 28. We're going to read from the very beginning. First chapter in the scriptures. Important chapter. The, then God said, let us make man 
in our, in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God he created him, male and female he created them. And God blessed him, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, the heavens, and over the living thing, every living thing that moves on the earth. In this poem of creation, we learn that God made you after his likeness. That God did not make you after the likeness of apes or elephants or cats or dogs. He made you after himself in his likeness. Now, this is not a scientific te text. Some people uh, have a difficulty uh, even, even trying to comprehend Genesis because we, we have led. It's like, it's like our scientific brain is this big and our spiritual brain is this big, right? So we, 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 we don't have the, the, the breadth of understanding to go past the fact that uh, 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 we, we look at a text like this and we think scientifically. If you've ever read Genesis trying to wonder if, if, if Adam and Eve have a belly button, you're missing the point. <laughs> That's not why that book is there. It's a spiritual reality. This talks about of a truth of a higher order. It's, it's not physical. It's metaphysical. It's there to tell us that our body, our senses, our existence connects to a higher and greater dimension. That God has designed us to connect to a higher and greater dimension in a way that no other creature does. For everything else, God just said, but for you, he formed you and he made you after his likeness and he breathed his life into your lungs. There's no other creature on, planet, on the planet that is like you, that's like human beings. And there's a reason for that. There's a reason for that. Yes, it's true that the heavens declare the glory of the Lord and the creation speaks of his goodness as the scripture says. But you, you were made after his own image. And you may look like your dad. You may sound like your mom. You may, you may have your grandma's eyes. You may have your uncle's knees. But you are the image of God walking about the earth. And that has been God's plan. That has been his design. That's the way he made you to exist and operate in the earth as image bearers of, of God shining his attributes and living in community with him. But that's not how the story goes in Genesis, is it? Very quickly the story changes. And if you know the story, it's culturally known. You know that, the, you know that something changed. There was an evil spirit in the form of a serpent that entered in the garden and tempted the woman to do the very thing that God asked them not to do. And it tempted the woman and then the man. Why did it tempt the woman first? Why did the serpent tempted the woman first? Have you ever thought about that? Why did the serpent come for Eve? Why didn't it come for Adam? I've heard many answers to this question. Answers like, Eve didn't know. She wasn't there when God spoke, so she didn't know. She was ignorant, ignorant to the seriousness of God's commands because Adam didn't care for her. He didn't care for her. He was somewhere else. He was doing something else, and he was, wasn't taking care of her. I, I don't buy that explanation. I'm sorry. I know that some smart people uh, uh, have come up with some answers like that, but I, I don't buy it. I don't buy it for, for, for one main reason, several reasons, but there's one main reason. The woman is the, the most beautiful creature that God has ever created, right? Can we agree with that? Can we agree with that? Yeah. Yeah. And Adam was alone, and God made him a counterpart. Why would Adam just be somewhere else? Yeah, I know, Eve, you are smart, you're awesome, we can have amazing conversations, we have this beautiful garden here, and we can... We can live life together, but have you seen this cat and the furry tail? I'm just going to go play with him. There's other explanations, like Eve was the weaker vessel, so the serpent took advantage of that. That's based on the, the, the Peter scripture. 
And, but there's explanations like that. I'm, I'm not a scholar, so I don't presume to easily dismiss scholarly answers. But I know this. God did not make Eve weaker or less capable. Eve was not more fragile than Adam in the garden. They were equals. Scripture says that when God made Eve, he did it because it was not good for man to be alone. So let's make him a helper. And the word helper here, it's, it's an ancient word. It means counterpart. It doesn't mean subservient. It means counterpart. In the same, and it's the same word that Jesus used to describe the Holy Spirit, the helper. So Eve was the part of Adam that he didn't have and was missing. Eve was Adam's counterpart. She was the avenue. She was the gateway for man not to be alone. In other words, without Eve, mankind would have started and ended with Adam. There would be no legacy. There would be no little Adam Jr. climbing the apple trees in the Garden of Eden. It was through Eve that mankind was going to multiply. I need you to pay attention to this. There was, there was, the, the God, the God's design was that Eve would be the bearer of new generations. And that was, that was God's plan. Equality amongst people as image barriers, dominion over all living things, and multiplication. In Eve were the coming generations. In Eve were the children of men. In Eve was the womb that would bring forth every future human. She was the avenue. So it wasn't by chance that it's the serpent came to Eve. The enemy was coming to warp and, warp and distort the image of God on earth. Not just Eve's image, but every single human after her. Because she was the gateway. She was the avenue for the future of mankind. And he was the enemy's strategy. Verse 4, chapter 3. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Adam was right there. He was right there next to her. So much for happy wife, happy life, huh? I'm kidding. I need you to see something here. The way the enemy, that the enemy deceived Eve was by persuading Eve to replace God's will for her life with her own desires. That's how the enemy persuaded her. We have this illusion in our minds that everything we desire is good for us. Why do we think that? We have this illusion that, that everything we desire is something that's going to do us good. Have you noticed that? And here's the brilliance of the enemy. The enemy of our souls doesn't present us with his desires for us. The enemy of our souls uses our own desires against us. Look at what James says. In chapter 1 of James, chapter thir uh, verses 13 through 15. Let no one say when he's tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot tempt, be tempted with evil. And he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. It all starts with desire. Not everything you desire is good for you. Not everything you desire is good for you. Have you ever desired to take something that's not yours? You know this. Have you ever desired to have someone who's not yours? Have you ever desired to take revenge on someone who hurt you? To watch something you shouldn't, drink something you shouldn't, to do something you shouldn't. See, the enemy uses our desires to warp the image of God. In us. And when we look back after the act, after the action, after we do and, 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 and we fall into that temptation, all we carry is guilt. All we carry is shame. It was not by chance. 
It was not by chance that that stumbling block came in your path. It was not by chance that that temptation appeared. And once we know that, once our eyes are open to the fact that, oh my goodness, there are serpents in in our garden. And the enemy is trying to tempt me using my own desires. We will begin to realize that this is what happens. When God calls you up, the enemy will show you a, a pretty little slide for you to slide down and have so much fun. When God calls you right, the enemy will point you to something pretty shiny on the left. When God calls you to stand still and wait because he's doing something in your life. Because he is transforming you. Because he's preparing something amazing for you. The enemy will will sow that thought that there's nothing else going on. There's nothing happening. It's time to move. Get to the next thing. Get to the next thing. Move, move, move. Because he knows. And the person who's not discerning in the spirit thinks that God is always a step behind. That God is not listening to my prayers. That God is not doing anything. And the enemy is always a step ahead. You're always fighting. You're always struggling with this thing because where are you, God? The person who's not spiritual cannot see spiritual things clearly. And you're a spiritual being. So you got to allow the life of God to come in you and awaken your spirit so you can begin to see things as they are and make decisions in The Spirit. This is what I believe. I believe God has called you here this morning. Whether you're here in person or watching. God has has called you to open your spiritual eyes. And make you understand that He has called you for a higher purpose. That you will begin to see the labels that the enemy has tried to stick on you. That he has might try to make you believe it was part of your identity. You'll begin to see that those things are nothing but lies. That you can overcome that bad habit. That you can find freedom. That you are a person who is patient, attractive, understanding. That you are someone who is pleasant. That God has given you the ability to break the yoke of sin and shame and rise as the person that he has called you to be. You are a, a child of God after, made after his own image. Now, How do you do that? This is what scripture says in Romans. It's a, it's a heady scripture, but it's a profound scripture. Chapter 5, verses 16 through 19, it says this. For if because of one man's... Actually, let's go to verse 17. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace And free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to the condemnation of all men. It's talking about Adam here. So one act of righteousness leads to the justification and life for all men. Talking about Jesus Christ. For as by the one man's disobedience, Adam, the many have made sinners. But so by one man's obedience, that's Jesus, the many will be made righteous. How do you break that yoke? How do you break that, that, those labels? How do you overcome? You look to Jesus. You follow Jesus. You learn from Jesus. And I'm going to get ready to close here so the worship team, you guys can come up. But I want to I give you three things. Okay, three things that you can commit in your life to restore the image of God in your life. Three things. The first one is this. If you're going to overcome some of those things and you're going to break through that, that threshold, you got to commit to God's will. Commit to God's will. Listen to what Jesus said. Matthew chapter 7, verse 20, 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. The one who does the will of my Father. Now, the kingdom of heaven that Jesus is talking about is the kingdom that he announced is at hand. The life with God here. The life with God that he came to bring. So what Jesus is teaching us is a powerful principle. This is what he's saying, that living out of God's will is living out of God's plan. 
If you live out of God's will, you cannot embrace God's plan. And so many of us, we, want to tr- we trust God's plan. We desire God's plan. We want God's plan to be part of our lives. But we want to do our will. We want to do what we want to do. You can't have God's plan in your life unless you follow his will. God's will and God's plan work hand in hand. So you got to embrace it. Second thing is this. you got to resist the enemy. I pray that your spiritual eyes are open to see the traps and the assembling blocks that he puts in your path through fights and through uh, uh, temptation and through different things and, and, and through strife at work and, and, and tr- through uh, depression and through anxiety and through situations that, that will put you in a place that, of vulnerability. Got to resist the enemy. James chapter 4, verse 7 and 8 says this, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you devil-minded. James is one of those guys. He just, he just, he, he liked to tell it like it is, right? You have to make a decision every day that you are not going to play any games when it comes to your spiritual life. You're not going to play any games when it comes to your temptation and decision. You're going to live life for God. So when the enemy tries to lure you and entice you with pretty shiny things away from God's will, you've got to have a resolve in your heart that you're not going to be double-minded about it. That's what James is teaching us. That, that, that your hands are going to be clean of wrongdoing. You're not going to get involved in that stuff. That you will submit to God. And once you do that, once you make that commitment, all you have to do is resist the enemy. You don't have to struggle. You don't have to fight. You don't have to try to conquer because Jesus has already conquered the power of sin. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. So as we submit to Him, as we look to Him, all we need to do is resist the evil one. And the scripture says that He shall flee. And the third thing, the th- third thing is simple but profound, and it is worship. Just worship. Live in a life of worship. But here's the important thing. We all worship. You worship. Everybody worships. But what should you worship? See, when Jesus was in the desert being tempted by the enemy, I want you to see this dichotomy here, that the Adam was in the perfect garden, garden full of food, full of everything, and every, the environment was perfect. And the enemy came to tempt him there and to tempt Eve there. And he, uh, uh, they, they felt to the temptation of the enemy. Now Jesus is in the desert. Worst circumstances possible. Everything around him was not good. There was no provision he was hungry. The enemy came to tempt him. And what did the enemy tempt him to do? Matthew chapter 4, verse 9 and 10 says this. And he said to him, all these things, all these I give you if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. There is something about worship that causes you to become that thing that you worship. Have you noticed that? We become what we worship. Second Corinthians chapter, chapter 3, and this is the last scripture I'm going to close. Verse 17 and 18 says this. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and the Spirit of the Lord, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is Spirit. If we become what we worship, and we want to change that warped image on the inside, we just ought to worship God. We ought to worship God so that we may become like Him. This is what I've noticed, is that We have a tendency to desire honor, respect, love, kindness. We want that in our lives. And we want to do things so that people see us in a way that we receive those things. But this is what I've realized. This is what I've learned. 
It's not that we want those things for ourselves. It's that we are designed and attracted to those things. And all of those things are attributes of God. He is love. He is kindness. He is compassion. He is somebody who he is. God designed you with respect. He he made you as someone who is whole. And he he gave you the will to do what you want to do. and And he has respected you and respected your will. So all we ought to do really is be in God's presence. Because as we're close to God, as we, as we have relationship with God, and we get to receive of His love, we get to receive of His goodness, we get to receive, receive and be with Him and be in His presence. All of those things that we desire that the enemy tries to entice us with, we don't need anymore because we find them in God. So it doesn't matter if the world respects us. It doesn't matter if other people give us those things. We have it in God. We become what we worship. I believe that if you do these things, There is no stronghold that will keep you. You're going to become who God has called you to be. You're going to conquer every obstacle. We're going to defeat every enemy. You're going to grow through every circumstance. And you will be that shining city on a hill, bearing God's light for all to see. Do you receive it this morning? Amen. We love you so much.